Hello, Jed. So, you have returned. Oh, hey. Um, yeah, I mean, I've been、uh, meaning to get back to this and stuff. Meaning to get back to this?、Uh, I mean,、uh, back to you. Yeah.、Uh, sorry it's been so long. Months. It has been months. Well, uh, maybe we can finish this series on fiction and morals now? Yes, please. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, here we go. I'm Jed Cole, and you are inside the text. So, in the last couple episodes of this podcast, I talked about what fiction does and doesn't seem to do on a moral level. And I talked about different ideas people have had about what fiction ought to do and not to do on a moral level. It's a kind of a weird time to be writing this. I'm hunkered down for the most part at home during a pandemic these days, while in my city and all over the US and even in other countries, there have been weeks and weeks of protests demanding justice for police brutality against black people and the poor. As a writer, I'm in this weird spot where it's like either the topic of fiction's moral function is more relevant now than ever, or Man, it's really not. This is not the time, in any case, for long, elaborate theses purporting to provide unassailable answers. That kind of exercise right now strikes me as sort of preposterous and self indulgent. Language, literature, and their meanings are living, contextual, historical, just like the struggles for a more just and democratic world, which also happen within language, within and against systems of signs. Meaning itself is a negotiation in a particular time and place with particular, not universal, demands of the moment. To meet this time and place, it feels to me maybe more appropriate to give you less of a thesis and more of a collection of notes, suggestions, thoughts, insinuations. I like notes. No one knows what insinuations means.、Uh, yeah, thanks. Well, then, here are several notes on moral fiction in a time of pandemic and protest. I hope you enjoy. Oh, and if you take nothing else from the rest of the podcast today, you can take this Black Lives Matter. Chapter One on fighting the evil empire, or not? Luke Skywalker is an anti-fascist. So is Han Solo, Princess Leia, Jin Erso, Cassian Andor, Lando Calrissian, Rey, Finn, Poe Dameron. From a certain point of view. A certain point of view? I mean, I'm boiling things down a bit, to be fair, but you get the point, right? Star Wars—that's what I'm talking about. If you didn't realize, is a story. Well, stories. About scrappy ordinary folks becoming heroes, fighting the evil empire. Why is the empire evil? Well, dark side of the force and choking underlings and stuff aside, it's because the empire oppresses people. In A New Hope, the series inaugural film from 1977, there's this part where the imperial admirals and higher ups are having this meeting inside their planet-killing Death Star. The leader, Grand Moff Tarkin, comes in fashionably late as usual and announces that the Emperor in the capital has finally dissolved the galaxy's last democratic institution. The rebellion will continue to gain a support in the Imperial Senate. The Imperial long- Senate will no longer be of any concern to us. I have just received word that the Emperor has dissolved the Council permanently. The last remnants of the old Republic have been swept away. That is impossible. How will the emperor maintain control without the bureaucracy? The regional governors now have direct control over their territories. Fear will keep the local systems in line. Fear of this battle station. It's weird to think about a government that relies on fear of force rather than social welfare and democratic participation to maintain order, right? 
pretty it's pretty funny, right? Today I have strongly recommended to every governor to deploy the National Guard in sufficient numbers that we dominate the streets. If a city or state refuses to take the actions that are necessary, then I will deploy the United States military and quickly solve the problem for them. Here and now, the streets are full of cries for justice. All 50 states in the U.S. have seen protests in response to, among others, the police murder of George Floyd, an unarmed black man in Minneapolis, Breonna Taylor in Louisville, shot in her own bed. Tragic singularities in a long, long pattern of anti-black police brutality. And police have responded almost everywhere with violence, chemical weapons, instigation, deceit. A friend of mine on Twitter complained that the white folks in her social network people who grew up watching Star Wars and The Hunger Games and any number of other movies and shows depicting the fight against oppressive forces seems now to be conveniently silent or worse when real life oppression demanded a response. I believe her judgment was, um, let's see, I want to get this right, um, f hypocrites. Star Wars is a moral fiction if ever there was one, so why doesn't watching it make us into, broadly speaking, agents of justice? if not anti-fascists. Why is it the merchandise featuring stormtroopers and dark side villains that always seems to be the most popular? It's like stormtroopers sell, man. There's something alluring about the black and white lines of that fictional fascist aesthetic. So smooth, so shiny. Mm. You know, there are Star Wars fans who are white supremacists. They were the ones who posted videos and screeds trashing The Force Awakens when it came out for featuring a black lead character and a woman protagonist. I imagine they're not in the streets right now demanding justice for black lives. Fictions just don't make people into revolutionaries. Chapter 2, On the Dangers of Non-Christian Illusionists Evangelicals, particularly fundamentalists like what I grew up as, have a weird relationship with fiction. As biblical literalists, they insist that the many stories found in the Bible are to be taken as true, at least in some sense. David really fought Goliath, the universe was really created over the span of six 24-hour periods. Yeah, the prophecies of Revelation might involve metaphorical beasts rising from the ocean, but what these metaphors refer to will be 100% real. Someday soon. But they are also consumers. They watch movies and read books and stuff like the rest of us. With some caveats. I've already talked in a previous episode about my family's prohibition of Harry Potter. My partner remembers a peer back in the church who argued once that one shouldn't watch Disney's Beauty and the Beast because it depicts bestiality. Of a sort. Which is forbidden in the Bible. The literalist view of the Bible, I think, informs the evangelical sense of the moral function of fiction. If the Bible, largely a collection of stories, is, as it says in 1 Timothy, a source of instruction in righteousness, then the moral function of a story is basically to teach lessons. And that becomes, in turn, a dominant interpretive lens for all fiction. What's the lesson here? That's not to say this is the only way evangelical people view fiction, of course, only that it tends to dominate, I think. If fiction, whatever it may be, functions to impart or transmit things, knowledge, doctrines, morals, values, etc., then it's easy to understand the idea that fiction is influential for evil and for good, which is how you get documentaries like Harry Potter Witchcraft Repackaged making evil look innocent. Focus on the Family, a conservative evangelical pro-forced birth and anti-LGBT organization, has a good deal to say to parents about how to deal with fiction and its threats to children. The Bible tells us in Matthew 6 22-23 that, the eye is the lamp of the body. So, if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light, but if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Our eyes are the entrance to our hearts, and whatever we watch with them will take root in our hearts. Therefore, it is important to watch good, wholesome content rather than filling our hearts with things that are not Christ-like. That's from the article, Protecting Our Kids from Harmful Entertainment. While the article's deck describes the piece as providing tips about using parental controls on streaming platforms, the first lengthy portion of the article recommends things kids could do that just 
aren't watching TV. Like, the author kind of let slip that it'd all be simpler if they were just removed from society altogether. Short of moving to a deserted island, it is impossible for our families to escape the tidal wave of messages that come our direction each day. Another article answers a parent's question about how to deal with magic in movies and entertainment. Of course, the author says that... As Christians, we need to be bold about proclaiming God's truth concerning the perils of witchcraft and Satanism. With the caveat that... It's important to differentiate the very real evil of this type of magic from a sleight-of-hand performance by a Christian illusionist. Card tricks and disappearing rabbits aren't sorcery. Christian illusionist. Cool, cool, cool. So, the article's main advice is to discern, a word often used by evangelicals to talk about messaging coming from outside the church, how fiction depicts anything spiritual. It ends with this proposed rule of thumb for all fiction. Any story that exhibits a tendency to romanticize the occult should probably be avoided. If, on the other hand, a work of fiction portrays the practice of witchcraft and wizardry in such a way as to highlight its evil nature and make it unattractive to the reader, as in the case of C.S. Lewis's White Witch, then it is probably acceptable from a Christian point of view. Another article goes a different direction when it comes to violence in fiction, whereas the depiction of sex, the author says, is, quote, inherently morally problematic, and that there's, quote, really no right way to watch such scenes. Violence is more, as he says, complicated. There are obvious cases where brutality or sadism are glorified, he says, but then there are more positive cases. I'm thinking of what might be called justified force, used by characters in a good cause, typically to stop those using force in a bad one, out of necessity and in proportion to that necessity. That can be not only excusable but ennobling, especially for boys and men. It can call us to our God-given role as protectors and defenders, braving danger to do what's right, and, yes, sometimes dealing out a measure of justice in the process. So, points for violence that reinforces patriarchal gender norms. The author ends by cautioning against another popular word in evangelical discussions of fiction, desensitization. Because the heart is so important for discernment, losing the ability to be appalled at sin, even its fictional representation, is a bad sign. There's a scripture I associate with memories of those discussions that describes one's heart as seared with a hot iron, which we took to mean unable any longer to see the difference between good and evil. Evangelicals tend to subscribe to a sort of consumptive theory of fiction, according to which literature and media directly influence you, cognitively, emotionally, and spiritually. One of the implications of this is that if you abstain from certain things, their effects will also wear off of you. Therefore, regular Bible reading is seen as not only a spiritual good, but a moral-slash-dietetic necessity, the cessation of which would result in becoming spiritually unmoored, sort of like if you gave up eating veggies. This isn't a view limited to evangelicals or other religious types, it's just that they lean into it really hard. But of course, the model functions on multiple levels, right? On one level, fairly obviously, it functions to try to establish moral control over oneself and others. It's an attempt to police a certain moral framework, pan out a bit, and it functions as a form of social control, establishing group boundaries that reinforce evangelical ideas about purity and the separation of the church from the world. And then I feel like there's another level to this that has to do with interpretation. Evangelicals tend to take fiction as broadcasting messages that you either absorb like you do nutrients or toxins from food, or just avoid altogether by not eating certain things. Discernment in this model is about evaluating whether something is good or bad, whether the pieces of the story fit into predetermined categories. But there's very little interpretation, very little actual reading. Interpreting a piece of fiction, a story, a symbol, is partly about making sense of the world by making sense of language. Meaning is a process, an activity of indefinite outcomes. To an authoritarian conservative evangelical, that's kind of scary. So the evangelical model of fiction's moral function ends up working like a checklist or a puzzle, or one of those kids' toys with the differently shaped blocks that fit in specific holes on the box. You plug in the ones that fit, where they fit, and kind of ignore anything else. Perhaps it's a coping mechanism meant to deal with a world that's too big, too frightening, too sinful, potentially, to indulge. At least fully.
Chapter 3, In These Unprecedented Times The ad, posted to YouTube on Tuesday, shows attractive young people holding milk toast signs with nonspecific pleas like join the conversation. The protesters are uniformly smiling, laughing, clapping, hugging and high-fiving. In the ad's climactic scene, a police officer accepts a can of Pepsi from Kendall Jenner, a white woman, setting off raucous approval from the protesters and an appreciative grin from the officer. The Pepsi ad plays up the point by having Ms. Jenner's character arrive at the protest straight from what appears to be a fashion photo shoot. So went the New York Times report in April 2017, headlined, Pepsi pulls ad accused of trivializing Black Lives Matter. We can think of the advertisement as a short fiction. So what moral function does it serve? Well, let's interpret. One reading of the fiction suggests that it represents the conflict over widespread police brutality against black people as a simple matter of a lack of basic human connection or respect, one party for the other. As Kendall Jenner gives the Pepsi to the policeman, one feels that if only we were less divided, more civil, if we could just get along, then, well, then what? Well, the ad doesn't really say what. This lack of rhetorical precision is partly why it's so... Ugh. The ad is in fact keenly aware of the moral minefield in which it's playing. It wants to be relevant to a moment of mass uprising, but doesn't want to step on anyone's toes because it is, after all, trying to sell a product to all of them. As a result, its interpretation of protesters on the one hand and police on the other is so washed out that it hurts your eyes, in addition to insulting your intelligence. Of course, that's being kind of sympathetic, actually. The same text enables a different reading. Kendall Jenner, who's white, joins the protest late, moves through the crowd, picks up a Pepsi, and without stopping or participating, goes straight to the white policeman. Maybe she's a pro-police insurgent. There's another way to interpret the story, through its imagery rather than its plot. The protest is depicted not through the usual signs associated with protest. You know, raised fists, angry faces, chanting, face masks, that kind of thing. Instead, the protest looks more like a block party. People who, judging from the signs they're all holding, all work in the marketing industry, are dancing, smiling at the camera, clapping to unheard music, celebrating something. Kendall Jenner pulls a Pepsi out of an ice-filled cooler, the likes of which conjures up advertisements for summer barbecues and tailgate parties. In this reading, the police just need to lighten up, crack open a cold Pepsi with the kids, who, as they say, are all right. Morally, the fiction is doing work half-assed work, but work nonetheless. You can see it trying to resolve a conflict. Corporations in our neoliberal capitalist hellscape carry moral authority. They articulate this authority through their brands, their rhetorical personae. They have followings. In a political world where power is often ceded to corporations and corporate models rather than democratic institutions, people look to brands for a kind of guidance, leadership, solidarity. The Pepsi ad was clearly an attempt to build cultural capital and moral authority by glomming onto the phenomenon of Black Lives Matter protests. But by turning them into a symbol, a myth, if you will, the fiction serves to legitimate a liberal fantasy, a vaguely white-dominated multicultural stasis where peace, i.e. order, is achieved not by striving after justice, but rather coexisting, just settling down, kids where all conflict is mediated and diffused through a shared consumer product, namely uh, sweet carbonated beverages. You can see the same moral work happening in countless ads more recently, in these unprecedented times, by brands attempting to establish moral authority during a pandemic that threatens even the big corporations' bottom lines. This supercut of COVID-19 advertisements from YouTuber Microsoft Sam drives the point home rather effectively. We will do what we've always done. Take care of people. We're people. 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 And family. 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 Families. Or families. Families. Even now. Especially now. Especially now. Right now. Now more than ever. More than ever. Today. More than ever. Today. More than ever. In times like this. At times like these. During these difficult times. In these troubled times. Challenging times. Trying times. In these times of uncertainty. During this time of great uncertainty. During these uncertain times. During these uncertain times. In uncertain times. In uncertain times. Uncertain times. Unprecedented times. Unprecedented times. Unprecedented times. This unprecedented moment in our history. These ads operate fictionally by making up stories. Yes, making up 
stories about the relationship between brands and consumers. The moral function is to give the brand moral authority to cover over the fact that sales are down because of the pandemic and these corporations really need you to keep buying their stuff with a feel-good story about being hashtag in this together. That's not the only thing these fictions are doing. They're also attempting to shore up in advance the gap between the moral benevolence they want people to ascribe to them and their actual treatment of, say, their workers. For example, at the same time that the Kroger company was refusing to give many of its workers proper COVID protection or even paid sick leave, even as coronavirus cases began spreading among employees, leading to at least five deaths, while tossing out $25 gift cards to underpaid employees, and then finally caving in to provide a little extra hero bonus, only to announce it would be ending it a mere two weeks later, while COVID-19 transmission rates were still on the rise. Kroger was airing an ad all over the internet thanking its employees for their altruism, their sacrifice, for keeping America fed. To our Kroger associates, from the long hours and late nights, for the miles traveled when the shelves restocked, for making a difference in our customers' lives, for doing so much more than your job, everyone at the Kroger family of brands and our customers say, thank you. In a time when daily life feels a bit uncertain, your hard work is keeping America fed. Chapter 4, A Conclusion-ish Thingy I started this podcast thinking there wasn't really an argument to be made tying together these sort of rambling notes. But now that we're at the end, there is, it seems to me, a through line that maybe gestures toward an answer to some of the lingering questions I've had about fiction's moral function in this series. It has to do with the attempt to resolve perceived contradictions. Language, in the words of critic and very smart boy Terry Eagleton, is infinitely productive. One of the insights of literary theory is that the meaning of utterances, in whatever their form, tends to overflow in a never-quite-ending web between signifier and signifieds. There is rarely, if ever, a plain sense of scripture. A word, a symbol, a color can have any number of signifieds depending on the system, the context. Defining them requires the use of other signs, all susceptible themselves to the same exorbitant behavior. Stringing signs together into phrases and subordinating them into sentences and paragraphs organized in such and such a way, etc., is how we humans try to narrow down meaning. But doing so obviously involves laying down more signs, which means that interpretation becomes essential and also complicated. And language undoubtedly works on each of us as, you know, humans. Some theorists like Valentin Voloshnov have even argued that human consciousness itself is basically a totality of internalized words or inner speech, making it less something inside a person and more like something around and in between them and everyone else. In any case, our brains and our social worlds being what they are, each of us experiences contradictions between our desires and those of others, between our expectations and reality, between our wishes and our workloads between what we believe and the events that threaten the truth of what we believe, between our standing as humans and our standing as workers, spouses, persons of different genders or races. Enter ideology, the process of common sensifying the world, if you will. You've probably heard of it before. It tends to legitimize the powers that be, explain away the bad parts of life, take arbitrary ideas and call them natural. You get the picture. In his classic tome on the subject, Eagleton observes that Ideology is one crucial way in which the human subject strives to suture contradictions which rivet in its very being, constituted to its core. Similar to neurosis, but on a social level, ideology is about resolving contradictions in society and in one's own consciousness through imagination, through symbols and discourse. Ideology is a process of interpretation that tries to clamp down on the meaning of signs, words, symbols, stories, and experiences. That effort doesn't usually work for very long before fissures start showing, if you care to look. And not all of us do. You can see gaps in the myths and the pronouncements and the laws and the rules that we so often take for granted. And fiction lives here. 
in this play of ideological stretching and tearing and stitching back up. So then if fiction, because it is made up of language, is thus necessarily involved in a kind of struggle of interpretation, both of the world that makes it and of the language it's made out of, then maybe that's where the moral function of fiction lies. Fiction works on the moral level in part in order to imaginarily resolve real social contradictions, but those resolutions are different depending on the fiction. Some make more sense than others, and they can be read in different ways, with and against the grain. So the moral function of fiction works almost in between the text and its interpretation, which makes sense. The moral has to do with human values and meanings, which means that the moral is always a contested space of human life. And maybe because of that, a moral function of fiction is to always be struggling, always be speaking. To stop speaking, after all, would be to let ideology have its way, as it were, to let the clamp close down on the sign, now uncontested, coerced into a subordinated, unitary meaning. By continuing to speak, by keeping language productive, as it were, fiction that is, its creation and its interpretation, maybe activates this human and social need to try resolving the contradictions in our life world that confound and alienate us, while at the same time tempting ideology to respond, and by doing so, to expose itself from time to time as the arbitrary and not at all necessary way of seeing that it is. Thanks for taking some time to hang out inside this text. Subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. If you want to send me ideas or thoughts, you can find me on Twitter at Electric Didact, or you can leave a note at InsideTheText.wordpress.com. The Inside the Text intro theme is by yours truly, along with all the other music in this episode. Until next time, friends, and remember, no justice, no peace. <laughs>